Welcome everyone to this new Voices in Global um, Health session. It's my pleasure to welcome all the speakers and everyone who is in the audience. Um, the session of uh, the new Voices in Global Health this year will focus on the perspectives and responses of young scientists to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, everyone who participates in this session um, is a member of a young academy and is sharing his or her experience um, of the coronavirus pandemic. A special focus in our session was to look at bigger systemic and structural responses rather than individual research, which both together are important. But the focus for this question is, for this session is really to look at the questions, for instance, how is the collaboration between different sectors evolving during the pandemic? What's the response that young academies or other institutions can have? Which, which opportunities and needs do we have for strengthening structures? So the way we want to proceed in this session is that we have six speakers. Each of these speakers will present in a short lightning talk their personal experience and then we will allow for some time of uh, discussion directly after each um, lightning talk. So the talk will be about seven minutes. There will be about five minutes for discussion. And we hope through this sort of interchanges between presentation or inputs and discussion, we will be able to facilitate interaction over the next one and a half hours with everyone who is participating in the session. Um, the way you can interact with us is to use the public chat forum. And we have two moderators who will read your questions to the speakers. And so everybody can hear these questions and then the speakers can respond. So please use intensively the public chat we have available already during the talk that we can have the discussion before we move on to the next talk. To introduce myself, my name is Stefan Kohler. I'm a member of the Global Young Academy and I'm one of your three um, co-hosts today together with my colleague Shalini Subash and Vibul Pia Vatanameta, both also members of the Young, uh, Global Young Academy. Shalini and Vibul will monitor the chat and read your questions. And I will, I will moderate the overall session um, and introduce the speakers as we go along. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Professor Shima Enani from the Egyptian Young Academy who will share um, her experience on diagnostics of COVID in Africa. Thank you, Shima. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I will share my presentation. So for, for now, is it OK? Did you see my presentation? Oh, okay. Uh, today I will talk about the COVID-19 diagnostics as a key to uh, Africa recovery. Uh, at, uh, at the beginning, as you know, that uh, in poor communities where many individuals share a single room and depend on going to work to put food on the table, the call for social isolation will be very difficult if it is not impossible to adhere to it. Based on the United Nations and the Human Development Index, like the uh, life expectancy at birth, average school attendance period, Africa considered as a poor continent. Not only a poor, but many African countries suffering from extreme poverty. That leads to hunger in Africa, and uh, more than 30% of African children suffer from growth disorders. Sub-Saharan Africa is the region with the highest infant mortality and around 25 million Africans are infected with infectious diseases, including 2.9 million children. 
Africa has faced a double burden of infectious diseases and chronic diseases. Chronic diseases including diabetes, sickle cell disease, stroke, chronic mental illness, while the infectious diseases like malaria, diarrheal disease, respiratory infection, and so on. According to the World Health Organization, about 50% of children under five mortality rates due to measles, diarrhea, malaria, tuberculosis infections are in Africa. These high mortality rates not only noted in African children, but also in African adults. Chronic diseases are the leading killer in high income African countries, while infectious are the leading killers in sub Saharan Africa. It is expected that by uh, 2030, the chronic and infectious diseases will be the top killers in Africa. As you can see in the map, Africa is the worst of region, particularly in sub Saharan part, where the rate is higher than 80. 1,000 disability adjusted life year, there 100, there 100,000. COVID-19 pandemic add insults to injury in this continent. The first confirmed case was in Egypt and the first confirmed case in Sub-Saharan Africa was in Nigeria. Most of identified imported cases arrived from Europe and the United States rather than from China where the virus was originated. It is believed that uh, the, the widespread underreporting in many African countries due to the less healthcare system, less developed healthcare system. Many of the healthcare, syst healthcare system in the continent are inadequate, having problems such as uh, leaking of equipment, leaking of funding, or uh, insufficient training of healthcare workers and insufficient data transmission. The number exceeded million by 6 August with five countries, as you can see in the slide, make up over 75% of the total confirmed cases. These countries like South Africa, Egypt, Morocco, Ethiopia, and Nigeria. Daily COVID-19 tests per thousand people worldwide during the period from January to October show that Africa is the least place performing the tests as clearly appeared in the map. As you can see, the green parts, is the area where the tests are carried. The continent has less than 0.1 of the world tests. And uh, according to the CDC, testing has been carried out in several countries in Africa. However, only small percentage of the population has been tested. For example, uh, around 1.3 in South Africa, and 0.1 in Egypt, 0.1 in Sudan. So that diagnosis is important to map the spread of the disease, identify hot spots and provided early intervention. As you can see, the confirmed cases in Africa is about 1,600,000, sorry. And the active cases is 200,000, recovered 1,300,000 and that this is, is 40,000 cases in 57 territories. Many barriers for COVID-19 diagnosis are placed in Africa. The true case numbers in Africa are believed to be significantly higher than that confirmed counts due to low testing rates. And this is because of the, the cost, the high cost, the limited resources, non-trained personnel, and the blended government assessment. Owing to these challenges and the threat of COVID-19 becoming a full-blown outbreak in Africa, straining already weak health system, many low- and middle-income countries' government must prioritize testing of suspected cases and traced contacts. Limited diagnostic capacity blinds government COVID-19 assessments and limiting the country's ability to deploy limited resources to maximum effectiveness. As a young scientist, we decided to have a role in response to COVID-19 pandemic in Africa. Uh, the next Einstein Forum gathered the young African scientists from different disciplines in NIF community of scientists COVID-19 mitigation that includes several themes for working on either policy, education about COVID-19 or analytics of COVID-19 data. One of these groups were the diagnostics and the clinical work and uh, in this work, we are working on multi-site Africa assessment of performance and implementation for three diagnostics platforms in some African countries like uh, Kenya, Malawi, 
Egypt, and South Africa. Moreover, our African team was also implemented globally in the Center for COVID-19 Innovation Diagnostic Implementation Working Group to augment the ongoing efforts to control the disease in low and middle income countries through improving uh, the existing resources and uh, uh, applying for some grant or funding for acquisition of equipment and testing kits at discounted rates more affordable for Africans. So finally, we can say that diagnosis helped Africa to tackle many problems at health, economic, and political levels. And the availability of diagnostic tests for COVID, although it is a demand globally, it is special demand in most African countries because population are living in crowded slums, which raises the possibility of spreading of this disease. Availability of rapid diagnosis will help better gauge the scale of infections and respond accurately to infection. Finally, we can say that diagnosis is the key to Africa's recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now please post the questions you have to, to our first speaker, Professor Inani in the chat, such that we can respond to them directly. Yes, there is one question to Gemma. Why Western Sahara seems to have less reporting cases than other nations in Africa? I'm sorry, the, Any, the last... yeah, yeah, there is one more question. Any vaccine trials or developments in Africa currently being done? Until now, yes, there is some trial for vaccine because we are a group in um, COVID-19 Diagnostic Coalition and uh, they are working in some uh, places for trial for vaccine development. Okay, there is uh, one comment uh, from Meghna Dimal who is from uh, Nepal and uh, he says that it's very inclusive and productive session. Congratulations to you for giving such a nice presentation. So... And there's one more question. Why Western Sahara seems to have less reporting cases than other nations in Africa? Why there is what? Sorry, the voice is not clear. Okay, I will repeat the question. Why Western Sahara seems to have less reporting cases than other nations in Africa? Maybe this is um, because there is no official data from the African government side. And as I said, there is many challenges facing African governments for the uh, presence of uh, equipment, uh, uh, facilities, and everything for using for diagnosis or for testing is not available in, in a good manner in Africa. And uh, there is uh, most of under-reporting data, we, we could estimate that from the surveys and questionnaires which is done through the social media, because we found that there is a big variations between this data and the announced, announced data which is released from the government. Okay, Shama, there is uh, one last question uh, to ask. You have mentioned that the NEF uh, uh, helped in mitigating this COVID, especially in Africa. So how did policies help in mitigating this COVID-19 situation, uh, especially uh, in, in Africa? Well, this is actually maybe done through uh, funding agents and linking between um, government policy makers and uh, organizations which are giving funds. And uh, sometimes uh, some organizations like WHO and CDC provide some special grants named for Africa. So that's why we are working in, as a young scientist to try to connect our governments with this organization to get the fund to establish a um, good laboratory and to establish place for uh, diagnosis of COVID-19. 
And of course, this will have a positive impact. We hope so. Sure, this will aid in removing some of the burden of diseases in Africa. Stefan, how, how are we doing on time? Do we, okay. do we still have time? Yes, I think it's good to move to our next speaker. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Daniel Limonta from the Global Young Academy, who will share his experience with expedited collaboration and partnership in the scientific community as a response to the pandemic. Hi, everybody. So it's my, it's my, I'm sharing my screen, is it fine? Yes, it's very good. Oh, that's good, that's good. Um, oh, so firstly, uh, good afternoon. Um, uh, I'm pleased to be a speaker for Berlin's World Health Summit 2020 and this new Voices of World Health session. Uh, my name is Daniel Limonta. I am a virology researcher originally from Havana, Cuba, and currently I work at the Lika Chin Institute of Virology located at the University of Alberta in Canada. I am honored to be a member of the Global Health Working Group of the Global Young Academy, um, the organizers of this session at this time. And I would like to extend my appreciation uh, for the Global Young Academy and for selecting me as a speaker for this session. And also I say thank you to Dr. Stefan Kuller for organizing interesting and relevant topics addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, the title of my talk is Expedited uh, Collaboration and Partnership in the Scientific Community as Response to Pandemics. To begin, I would like to include a couple of basic questions. What is a pandemic? So this word derives from two Greek roots, roots PAM meaning all and demos meaning people. So pandemic uh, involve all the people. That's why pandemics are global uh, phenomena. Now, how did COVID-19 start? Firstly, uh, COVID-19 is caused by another member of the coronavirus family, also known as SARS-CoV-2. Very likely you have heard of coronaviruses before as the previous causing agents of SARS in 2003 and MERS in 2012. Therefore, it's not completely unexpected that another coronavirus was able to cause a pandemic in 2019. Although, perhaps we did not suspect that it would cause such a significant unprecedented global crisis. Before the coronavirus pandemics, uh, the world suffered from other se severe pandemics as the Spanish flu in 1918, represented by this quite known uh, uh, picture taking the US at that time. In the previous pandemics, the scientific community uh, and governments learned that pandemics could happen over and over again. That's why early detection and effective and fast responses that demand huge human capital and material resources are critical. After the Zika virus pandemic started in 2016, I started to work with Zika virus and this is a, a picture of, of me and my lab colleagues at the University of Alberta uh, working with this Zika virus. However, uh, nowadays my main focus of work is SARS-CoV-2. What I have learned from my research in pandemics is that we should be able to respond to pandemics through expedited collaborations and partnerships because efforts among industry, nonprofit organizations, universities, and academies have the potential to offer better and faster responses to global health crisis. Furthermore, I believe that these organizations have a social responsibility to combine their strengths to accelerate the development of effective vaccines and drugs against pandemic causing pathogens. More importantly, without such efforts, effective therapeutics could not be available within a short period of time, and we would be having more lives lost and increase global economic devastation. The approaches to establish effective collaborations and partnerships during global health crises like the COVID-19 are through networking, good communication, honesty, accountability, common sense, trust, and goodwill. 
Fortunately, these approaches seem to have been working in, in many projects uh, that uh, uh, currently have been moving forward to do research about SARS-CoV-2 and to manufacture vaccines and drugs against this virus. And these are the take home messages of my talk. This COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated that expedited collaborations and partnerships are possible and can be successful. In addition, this global crisis has been a unique opportunity to showcase the capacities of the scientific community. And finally, one of the most important insights in the current pandemic is the need for continued capacity building to ensure successful responses to future global health crises. For example, is the causing pathogen of the next pandemic or disease X coming out anytime soon? I cannot finish my presentation without addressing the huge challenges that the sustainable development goals are facing during these pandemic times. Without the cross-sector commitment to pandemic prevention, the sustainable development goals will not be achieved. Thank you very much. So thank you, Daniel. Um, I have one question actually um, to ask since there's no question from the public yet. Why despite all the facilities, uh, why despite of all the facilities, well, it's not able to find vaccine yet. Well, it takes <laughs> time. It takes time. Um, uh, one of the of the main factors is that uh, the, the the scientific organizations and and, and, and and the industry was not were not completely ready uh, beforehand for such a such a big pandemic. For I mean, the disease X as was uh, uh, as I was uh, talking, and also. Uh, it takes time. It takes time. You, know, you, you have to, to, to have a, a preclinical candidate. You have to, to perform animal studies. And later, this, this kind of, of human uh, studies in, in the open population that uh, have started uh, since uh, several months ago. So there's one question from Matt that which is also our Global Young Academy member as well. So um, he asks, uh, he congratulates you on the fact that this pension is very nice and concise. The question is, why did well prepared developed country was affected by COVID-19 compared to low and middle income countries? Is that fair to ask? I <laughs> yeah, there is a, there is a clear uh, uh, difference. Uh, how these uh, uh, countries are facing the, the pandemic from the point of view of, of resources and, um, and the human, capi uh, human capital and um, uh, the surveillance of the disease, the, uh, also the, the, the reporting of the disease as the, my previous speaker was talking about Africa. So th those are main differences that are impacting the number of cases, the number of, of deaths, um, 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 and eventually will impact uh, when the, the vaccine is, is, is already implemented in these countries, the, 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 the vaccine programs will be also uh, related to the outcome of the, of the vaccination. Okay, one last question before we can move to the next one is that, <clears throat> so uh, you mentioned about the SDG. Um, well, um, this SDG here help us prepare for these pandemics and uh, particularly as young scientists, how, do, how could we actually contribute to, um, to this, global pandemic here. I think this is pretty important. Oh yeah, yeah, that's why I, I closed all my presentation with, uh, with the SDGs. Yeah, it is supposed that, one, I mean, one of the SDGs is, is health, right? And, uh, but as, uh, and again, uh, for this pandemic, uh, most of us were, were not ready for this. And, and, and global young academies and, and, and young scientists have a, a fundamental role to face this pandemic because we are just learning how to react and what we, we, we should have done before uh, because unfortunately it, this might be happening happening again as I mentioned in my in my in my in my talk so that this is like a, uh, uh, a, a negative experience but also it's like a, a learning experience for the future 
Thank you, Daniel. Have a good time. Yes. Stephen. We are moving to the next speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sri Fatmavati from the Indonesian Young Academy of Science. She will tell us about the Indonesian young uh, scientists' responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. I look forward to your presentation, Sri. Okay, thank you so much, Stephen. So good evening, everyone from Surabaya right now. Uh, eight, uh, 26 p.m. So today I would like to share with you, um, I will talk about, uh, so I will talk about uh, Indonesian uh, young scientists respond to COVID-19. So first of all, I would like uh, to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Sri Fatmawati. I'm a member of Global Young Academy and president elect of Indonesian Young Academy of, of Science, as well as chair of the Organization of Development in Science for the Developing World. And right now, I am assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry, Institute Technology, School November, or ITS uh, in Indonesia. So um, we know that entering 2020, the world was taken by the coronavirus outbreak which was spreading very rapidly throughout the world. And in early January, the COVID-19 pandemic occurred in China and had spread to several other countries. Um, there was a concern that the Indonesian government has not ready for this pandemic. So therefore, Indonesian Young Academy of Science, uh, together with Indonesian Young Scientists Forum and the International Association of Indonesian Intellectuals, as well as young scientists from all regions of Indonesia, we immediately formed a working group and held uh, online meetings with the result of providing uh, some recommendation for Indonesian government on the effort and policy in dealing with COVID-19 pandemic. So um, how Indonesian young scientists deal with the COVID-19? So through media, webinars, and recommendation. Okay, let me talk about the first is media. So we hope to embrace the media or science journalists in providing actual news about COVID-19. So then we collaborated with the Society of Indonesian Science Journalists and provide training to journalists who are competent and understand science to cover uh, COVID-19 news. In addition, we also work together in organizing webinar series for public. So the second is a webinar. As scientists from various fields of science and technology, we hope that through the webinar that we provide, we can educate the people about COVID-19 how it is spread, how to handle this virus, and provide education about proper health protocols. We have conducted about uh, seven webinars and wrote uh, seven articles in newspaper and provided seven recommendations to the government. So here are the example of our info, uh, the, 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 the graphics uh, that we have made. Okay, uh, and then, uh, we also think that actually all of us, Indonesian young uh, scientists, uh, start with these things. Start with ourselves, start with the small thing, start, uh, start from now. Start with ourselves here means our family, our neighbor, our institution, everything around us. And then start with small things, something that we can do and available at the moment. So let me give you an example. Uh, the following is an uh, example of our institution, Institute Technology 10 November or ITS, which is based in uh, Surabaya in East Java. So ITS responds to COVID-19 by forming the COVID-19 Task Force in March 2020. And we focus on protect ITS community from COVID-19 and contribute ITS innovation for the nation with tagline donation, production, and contribution. I myself play a, uh, a role as educator in ITS COVID-19 Task Force and uh, support some research related with COVID-19. So we provide COVID protocol, anyone who, had, uh, who still had activities in campus, something like that. And well, this one is uh, roles include making donation, 
uh, which is mostly uh, from alumni, lecturer, public, and staff. Uh, we produce some of the following items to be given uh, to the people who need it the most. So some of our products are hand sanitizer and disinfectant uh, for hospital and community health centers. And we also produce a medical assistant robot uh, to help medical personnel so they can work remotely and avoid uh, this one, yeah? uh, avoid COVID-19 patient. Uh, also Violeta here is a sterilization robot. And we also produce a hash suite is washable uh, washable, this is the medical, the washable protective has met sweet and mask. And we also uh, produce chamber for swab test and uh, sterilization. And one thing, uh, this face shield, we have face shield teams, very productive face shield teams. Uh, face shield is simple product, but indeed meaningful, which is not available at that time. So we produce more than 180,000. Uh, facial and delivered to 24 provinces in Indonesia. You know that Indonesia is the, the biggest uh, archipelago countries in, in the world. And that, that, that we have done. Uh, and now let me uh, show you more detail that what we perform in our laboratory, uh, laboratory of natural product and synthetic chemistry in ITS. So we perform education through a uh, webinars, uh, namely, uh, Talk, let talks about jamu, the science behind jamu. Jamu is Indonesian traditional medicine for health to avoid overclaim in the society. We know that uh, we, we, we know that some uh, in the society have the overclaim, and we produce local wisdom product, which is uh, which is um, uh, we use uh, scientific evidence on it. And such as like uh, herbal uh, drinks uh, for supplement to enhance the body immune system and also essential oils. Actually, all of these activities were also uh, performed by other Indonesian young scientists in their labs. And here the example of the, the product. And through the innovation and ideas to support the nation in dealing with COVID-19. Well, actually Indonesian young scientists who live in Indonesia and abroad have collaborated to overcome this pandemic. We we are, we not work alone, but we uh, collaborate with also with other uh, countries, scientists from other countries. Various activity and research are being carried to look for the preventive supplement as well as for treatment and vaccine and also innovation on medical devices. It is not responsibility of the scientists, the engineer, the medical personnel, not even the government of a country alone. And it is uh, the responsibility of all of us. Therefore, it is very important that we all work hand in hand to find the best solution for this problem. And thanks, uh, thank you very much for the Global Young Academy because uh, our, talk, our talk right now is very relevant with the pandemic preparedness in the age of COVID-19, which is global corporations, not uh, competition. So uh, last but not least, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity that was given to us for sharing our response during this pandemic. It is no more about I and you, but it is our responsibility to beat COVID-19. Thank you very much for your attention and warm uh, greetings from Indonesia. Thank you. Uh Thank you so much, Fatmavati, for such a wonderful, energetic uh, presentation. And um, uh, well, there is one question, and it comes from the uh, member, one member who is from Thailand, and he says that compared to Thailand, uh, we have very small number of infection. Could you help draw the distinction and why? What could be the reason? Thank you. Pardon, I, I uh. I cannot hear you clearly, Sharini. It's very sorry. Yeah. Can, can you please to repeat? The... Yeah, the question is, compared to Thailand, we have very small number of infection. Could you help draw the distinction? Why? This is the question from one member from Thailand. OK, thank you so much. Well, uh, I, uh, well, this is our, actually our challenges, yeah. Uh, Thailand uh, have uh, 
so many ways and also the detection yeah detection to 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 and tracing so uh, you know in indonesia we are archipelago country and um, it's quite a challenging to overcome when the when the virus spread to other islands uh, and also we you know that not all of the indonesian uh, area is uh, um, can get connected with the network, with the internet, something like that. So I think that's that's one of the reason. And but uh, and we know uh, that the, uh, the population of Indonesia, of course, uh, higher than Thailand. And we, I, yeah, we, we need to uh, more <laughs> and more um, active <laughs> to avoid this virus. Thank you, Shalini. Yeah. That, Thank I think you, that, Fatma that's my comment. Yeah, there is one more question. Um, see, uh, your efforts by Indonesian Academy, Eng Academy is great. So much uh, the Young Academy has contributed, but still there are so many deaths in Indonesia, especially uh, the medical personnel. So, and there are news like at least 136 doctors have lost their lives uh, due to this coronavirus. So what could be the reason and why? Yeah, uh, that's the, uh, well, uh, as I mentioned before, in the, in the beginning, uh, not, not ready, uh, our government is not ready yet, but, but uh, uh, you know that in Indonesia, we also challenging with the people. Yeah, we have uh, the higher uh, population, and we uh, we struggling with the we struggling with the what is it the test the COVID test, uh, and uh, we also to perform the active test and also the swab test. Uh, we collaborate with so many country, so I think uh, that's one of the reasons. Uh, anyway, uh, our uh, Indonesian young scientists, together with the government and also uh, some uh, private company, we produce and we try to the best that we can do for the for the nations. So that that's my comment. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Fatmawati. And I think, uh, Stephen, we should go ahead with the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you yes. so much, Fatmawati. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. So now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Paramjeet Singh from the uh, Indian National Young Academy. Paramjeet will share his experience on why COVID-19 pandemic builds a convincing case for investing in young physician leaders. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen, uh, for the introduction. Uh, um, is my screen uh, available with everybody? Is it okay? Yeah. Thank you. So, so I'll start. So, I am uh, Paramdeep Singh, and uh, I am basically a physician uh, working in one of the tertiary care teaching institute in North India. And I'll be speaking on the topic why COVID nineteen pandemic builds a convincing case for investing in the young physician leaders. So uh, the present COVID-19 pandemic has laid bare gaps in our healthcare systems that needs to be addressed shortly. There are pressing issues that are plaguing the healthcare systems across the world, especially in the lower middle income countries, which comprise low quality care, affordability, accessibility, poor infrastructure, violence against healthcare personnel, deficiency of the physicians and the healthcare staff. Therefore, the way we provide healthcare to the people across the world needs massive improvement. So we will be discussing about the need for effective healthcare leadership to manage the present healthcare crisis. So COVID-19 pandemic has put an immense physical and mental strain on the young physicians and doctors who are at the forefront in, in fighting this pandemic. Besides managing the patients, these young physicians had to deal with complex situations along with coordinating the logistics of the limited medical resources. Decision-making under these conditions of uncertainty can create significant psychological pressure. 
on the one hand the young physicians have to endure uncertainty about their own health and burnouts there are reports of violence against the, against the frontline health professionals by the segments of the misinformed public therefore it is more important than ever that we should not only invest in our medical workforce but also safeguard their welfare so the covid-19 pandemic has also led to an increase in incidences of burnout among the young doctors which adversely impact the quality of healthcare patient wellbeing and the patient satisfaction extensive evidence suggests that the organization and the practice environment play a crucial role in in uh, determining whether the physician remain engaged or they are burned out although a host of factors can contribute to the burnout and engagement these can largely be grouped into seven dimension which comprise the workload the efficiency the flexibility or control over work work life integration alignment of individual and organizational values social support or community at work and the degree of meaning derived from the work the world needs effective healthcare leaders for the solutions to the above cited issues so a group of the subject matter experts at the institute of healthcare improvement and safe and reliable healthcare have collaborated over 15 years to develop the framework for the safe reliable and effective care and highlighted in this in a white paper this framework is made up of two foundational domains the culture the learning system and the culture domains along with nine interrelated components with the patients and families at the core The, this framework brings together in one place all the strategic, clinical, and operational concepts that are critical to achieving safe, reliable, and effective care. It comprises nine interrelated components, which uh, which are the lead, which are the leadership, psychological safety, accountability, teamwork, and communication, negotiation, transparency, reliability, improvement, and measurement, and continuous. learning engagement of the patients and their families is at the core of this framework the engine that drives the focus of work to create a safe reliable and effective care these two domains are synergistic with a common component of leadership leadership is the common component in both the domains which is one of the most important factors in achieving safe reliable and effective care so there are fundamental differences in the traditional practice of medicine and the traditional practice of leadership many physicians make the mistake of assuming clinical skills translate into leadership ability the two do not always go hand in hand clinical skills are certainly a requirement but they are not enough leadership is about vision and strategy and moving a system culturally towards the triple aim of better health better care and the lower cost as the practice of medicine becomes more team based more focused on managing patient population over time and more focused on healthcare that is integrated across many boundaries the differences between the practices of medicine and leadership are shrinking the need for young physician leadership was never felt as stronger as is today in this time of global night global covid-19 crisis hence there is a need to inculcate the leadership qualities in the young physicians for a more effective response from them not only in managing health emergencies and crises but also in improving the healthcare systems so the present day medical training typically creates solo medical experts but the modern day management of the patients and organization requires teamwork and leadership while the physician leadership is vital for better health care this is not not usually a part of the medical training curriculum in order to profoundly alter the way the young physician think and work leadership training ought to commence during the medical school or earlier some of the leadership qualities that need to be incorporated into the young physicians are the teamwork collaboration emotional intelligence mindfulness advocacy self care conflict 
resolution and negotiating skills, interpersonal skills, influencing and motivating others, effective communication across different level of organizations. So to conclude the professional healthcare institution require physicians with leadership qualities. The modern healthcare system is dynamic and needs collaborative ethos and teamwork. The solutions to the pressing issues that are plaguing the healthcare systems around the world have to come from the dedicated physician leaders in order to profoundly alter the way the young physicians work and for creating physician leaders for the future, leadership training ought to commence during the medical school. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Singh. <clears throat> so um, I see no question from the audience yet, but I'll, I'm gonna ask uh, this question here. Um, so I. I guess in a way that the program that you are, are, are in, which is uh, YPL here, or Young, Physi Young Physician Leaders, are, are such a wonderful program. And um, I, I have seen the slide that, um, well, because of that know-how, um, you managed to actually overcome some of the obstacles. But, um, but currently, how is the situation in India, which is the, uh, the almost the third badly affected country due to pandemic? How, how could uh, YPL uh, alumni like you help contribute to the overall program of the, uh, of the uh, pandemic prevention or COVID-19? Yeah, uh, actually uh, India is uh, having a very large population and the doctor to population ratio is very low. So basically uh, in India, especially the young doctors are overworked. Mm -hmm. They are overworked and, and they are stressed out. So, and, and they are obviously having issues with their personal life as well as with their professional lives. And, and, and this, uh, this stress actually translates into low quality healthcare. The healthcare quality goes down. And these doctors, these young doctors who are actually overworked, they, they make more, uh, 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 they, are, they are not able to manage the healthcare in a better way. So by giving them leadership training, we would be actually actually investing in them and and they would be able to face these healthcare emergencies in a better way and and also they will also help to improve the healthcare systems in near future because they will be leading the healthcare systems in the near future mm -hmm. very good answer I still haven't seen a question from the audience. Maybe I'll, I'll have one more to ask. So ask the physician yourself, what is the most difficult thing to, to achieve during this pandemic here? I mean, even during treating the patients or find some drugs or anything that you think that come to you when you think of these patients? Yeah, actually uh, there is uh, not a single issue. There are actually many issues. The first issue is that we have to take care of our own health. We have to protect ourselves, and at the same time, because if if we get infected, we would be transmitting infection to our families also. So we have to protect ourselves, protect our families, and obviously we have to satisfy the patients also. So in uh, in India, we have a huge rush of the patients in the hospitals, and and there is limited infrastructure and limited health workforce and obviously uh, which which often translates into uh, healthcare uh, with which the patients are not entirely satisfied so we have to make sure that the patients are satisfied obviously with the low quality healthcare they, there are incidences of violence against doctors and other healthcare professionals and obviously, uh, since there is no uh, specific medicine to treat the COVID-19 patients, we, uh, we, we are having a hard time to treat the patients with, who are very sick. Mm -hmm. I see. Now I, I saw one question from the audience. Sorry, I tried to instigate. There's no, no many people asking questions. Now, one question from Fenderick Dan, Dandre here. The question is, um, as you, as you already mentioned about the, um, the, the burnout rate of those physicians, right? Perhaps uh, he suggests that um, uh, the, the government should be invest more in those facilities that prevent, do more prevention, that prevent building a strong foundation to prevent the PHC or primary healthcare worker 
to be burned out. And those preventive staff could help, you know, do the, 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 the primary tasks uh, before you actually see the actual patient. So um, do you have any comments on that? It's not actually a question, but it's a, it's a, it's a comment, I think, yeah. Perfectly agree uh, with the point that uh, along with the leadership training of the physician, what is more important that uh, uh, that we uh, that the government has to invest in the healthcare, which is obviously not adequate in the many lower middle income countries. The global population is rising, and uh, investment is in the healthcare is not rising at that pace. So we have to keep up with the growth in the population, and obviously the healthcare personnel. And, and the healthcare infrastructure is not sufficient to cater to the large populations. Great. I have one last question before we move on from Robert Rapini, our uh, GYA member as well. So the question is, what separates an effective leadership program or training from ineffective programs for public health experts? What type of program should, should there be? Well, uh, we need to have dedicated leadership program and nowadays uh, uh, leadership uh, the dedicated there is no provision of the dedicated leadership programs in the medical training curriculum so we don't have any leadership program even when i was trained uh, as a doctor i didn't have any leadership training so uh, in this way uh, the actually the current medical training typically creates solo medical experts but we, we need dedicated leadership programs, which has to be incorporated into the medical training curriculum. And so, so that uh, the physicians are not only good doctors, but they are also good leaders and good team members. Because medicine is a teamwork now. It is no longer a game of solo medical experts. Yeah. All right. Thank you for your answer, Dr. Singh. So I think we have to move for the next, uh, to the next speaker now. Thank you, very much. Thank you. So now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Munir Ahmed from the Global Young Academy and the National Young Academy of Bangladesh. And he will uh, draw our attention to the political influence by speaking about uh, science does not work without right political leadership. Thank you, Monir. I look forward to your talk. Good evening, everyone from Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I think you can hear and see my slides. Yeah. When you zoom them, like try to make them full size. We can see them, but... You just wait a minute. Clicking, I think. Please go in the presentation mode. Yeah. F5 or on the bottom, at the bottom next to the slider, next to the Zoom slider, you have the presentation mode. Yes, to the right. Yes, now. Yep. Mm. Good evening, everyone from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia mm. and from Kashmir University. I'm Muniruddin Ahmed, a citizen nationals of Bangladesh and permanent resident of Australia, now working in Saudi Arabia. I'm also a member of Global Young Academy and one of the founding members of Bangladesh National Young Academy. I have one more initiative that is Scientific Bangladesh. That's a bilingual <coughs> science magazine. It talks about science in Bangladesh. Our vision is to develop scientifically advanced Bangladesh by 2050. So today I'm going to talk about one of the important lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. That is science does not work without right political leadership. 
Uh, we all know much about pandemic, COVID-19 by this time. So I'll not go on details about that one. That is simply we say that first spread of a new contagious pathogenic virus which has no treatment at this moment, a specific treatment. So it is spreading throughout the war, well, <coughs> spread it already. Mm. And for fighting this pandemic, we know the science. We have the science and that science is very simple science. We have to stop entry of coronavirus through the respiratory system. To stop entry of virus, we have to influence people to adopt new lifestyle and habits, which include wearing masks, washing hands, maintaining distance from other people, and we also have to restrict movement of people. When the question of influencing people comes, then comes the leadership. Uh, so to fight pandemic, we need leaders, those who believe in science, take science-driven measures, and they are capable of making people comply with those measures. So we have seen um, in this picture, we see this women leaders from around the world who are successful in all these aspects. They believe in science, they have science-driven measures, and they were capable in implementing those measures. People followed these measures in their country. And this way they succeeded in fighting the pandemic. So um, fighting pandemic, implementing the simple science, in this case, political leadership is very, very important uh, because they have to make the decision at the right time, take the right measures and implement <coughs> the measures rightly at the right time to the right extent and why. <clears throat> so based on these um, thing, we can actually um, classify the countries of the world into four types. Uh, that is, we see developed countries or we can say resourceful countries, some resourceful countries, they have succeeded. On the other hand, we also see that some countries, they have <clears throat> resources to fight pandemic, but they fail. Other, on the other side, we also see the, <clears throat> that there are some poor countries, <clears throat> but they are successful in fighting the pandemic, but there are poor countries and failed. <clears throat> I don't want to give any example uh, of these countries, but I think you will agree with this classification of the countries in this world <clears throat> uh, in regard to fighting the COVID pandemic. Uh, so, um, we see the resources is not a big factor. So what is the differentiating factor? That is the leadership because without right leader, we cannot uh, influence people. We cannot build new lifestyle or habits and we cannot control the movement of people. Uh, and if we see this um, typing of the countries for typing, and look around the world, we see that there are global leadership crisis in the world. And it was also revealed in a <clears throat> survey by World Economic Forum in 2015. Uh, in that survey, 86% people uh, <clears throat> agreed that the world is suffering um, uh, from leadership crisis. We also see um, uh, <clears throat> that this crisis is um, distributed throughout the world in Asia, Europe, Latin America, Middle East and North America, uh, North Africa, no North America, Sub-Saharan Africa. Throughout the world we have leadership crisis. So, <clears throat> Uh, the lesson from this pandemic is that we have to, we have to develop leadership, um, right leadership. We have to address the leadership crisis and leadership believing in science um, in every sector, 
to fight feed pandemics because scientists are saying that this is not the last pandemic. Pandemic are coming. So we have to, we also know that climate science, uh, there is crisis in the climate crisis and there is enough science to tackle the climate crisis, but we don't have enough leadership. We don't have enough leadership, those who believe in, in climate science. And we also know that whether we, when we want to achieve any goal, we need three things. We need leadership, resources, and we need time. In spite of having time and resources, a country can fail in achieving the SDGs if that country does not have the right leadership. So I would like to conclude my presentation saying that address the global leadership crisis to address all the crises in the world. Uh, thank you for your patience hearing to answer any question if you have thank you so much uh, monir dr monir for addressing and bringing uh, this very important issue of uh, leadership and uh, there is one question uh, how could you describe the type of leadership you have mentioned in the slide especially for the country that you are living in that is saudi arabia Mm. Saudi Arabia, I can say actually in respect to COVID fighting, they are successful because um, uh, they have experience. They succeeded because they faced the um, SARS, um, I think Middle Eastern SARS COVID in 2012. So they have the experience. From that experience, they took the measures uh, at the very beginning. They went for lockdown, curfew, and other things. They also arranged lots of tested, <clears throat> not only Saudi Arabia, all of the Middle Eastern rich countries, uh, because testing is one very important thing for fighting the COVID-19. So <clears throat> they have a handsome number of COVID testing. Okay. And yeah. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Monir. Uh, there is one more question. Uh, like uh, when we say that, yes, science does not work without political leadership or emphasizing on uh, leadership, that it is very important. Uh, do you have any suggestions that in future, how can we create the global leader to avoid uh, such future pandemics or future uh, global crisis? Um, I would say scientists should come into politics. If we see, for example, Germany, example of Germany, um, we know um, <clears throat> she is a <clears throat> physicist. And that can be one option that we scientists should not be in the sideline just to advise the government. Uh, we should come forward to the politics. One thing, another thing actually, in every sector, we need leaders. So, but leadership is not in the curriculum. We mainly focus on technical abilities in our academic curriculum. I have experience from three countries, Bangladesh, Saudi Arabia, and Australia. Developed countries, they have more emphasis on leadership development. Even they evaluate the students, they evaluate how they perform in a team how they help other people, whether they speak properly, when their rights are not um, addressed. So, but in other part of the world, these are not addressed. So we need <coughs> leadership development should be part of um, <coughs> global curriculum. This way we can address the global leadership crisis. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Munir, for your enthusiastic and uh, nice presentation. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for your patience sharing. So then it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our next speaker, which is uh, Professor Kademul Islam from the National Young Academy of Bangladesh as well. 
And uh, I think you're even zooming out to a bigger picture looking at the society by uh, telling us about it's not a stigma and the missing link between science and society. I look forward to your talk, uh, Kadimul. Um, no, thank you. Can you hear me? Can you see the slide? Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kadimul Islam from National Young Academy of Bangladesh. I'm also uh, working in the University of Dhaka. Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology Department. I'm also a member of uh, Bangladesh Academy of Science and World Academy of Science. Um, today, I will be discussing the uh, importance of services that academicians should offer to the societies during this pandemic or such national or international crisis. Actually, pandemic is uh, not a new thing for this world, but for this generation. So we are not very much prepared for uh, this. So this pandemic has brought us many new things, including um, many new terminologies like outbreak, morbidity, mortality, quarantine, symptoms, vaccine, herd immunity, many, many uh, things. Uh, plenty of new terminologies actually, but uh, common people don't understand what is what and what is the necessary of it. Ordinary people don't know exact meaning of social distancing, quarantine, and need of it and how to do it. Um, some are maintaining it, like they are maintaining the social distancing, but while in developing countries and in many parts, most people do not understand the need of it. Uh, they learn just it by the fear of law enforcement personnel, not from the fear of virus. So they are actually not doing the right thing and actually, so they are transmitting this disease, the causative agent of which is invisible. So, uh, but it can be prevented with good practice like using mask and proper physical distance, not really the social distance. So when this pandemic uh, hit us, uh, this world in different uh, countries, including ours, we have seen that uh, there is a scarcity of doctors and medical equipments. Hospitals were not ready to treat the uh, patients. Like many of our hospitals were uh, actually declined to treat uh, the coronavirus uh, patient. Uh, we have also seen the same thing in, uh, in developing uh, developed countries like in Spain, there is a scarcity of uh, medical professionals. So coronavirus hospitals deal with the shortage of doctors. And not only that, uh, we have seen that there are some uh, hospital which is which could actually transmit the virus even um, their environment was not uh, uh, clean enough. Uh, on the top of that, we have seen that there is a lacking of uh, coronavirus testing kits. Uh, also, the testing facility were uh, limited. Uh, not uh, all the doctors so and medical prof professionals were actually trained enough on RT-PCR testing. Although in every university, we, uh, the, uh, the, all the biologists are trained uh, on how to do the PCR. So actually we should uh, have come forward to actually improve this situation. For example, we have hundreds of universities, but only five of them have come forward to make their own testing uh, facility. In, uh, in my university, we actually borrowed a uh, PCR machine from several departments to make our own coronavirus testing facility. Doctor used to send us samples in uh, our university. We actually helped them. Uh, we made our own uh, hand sanitizer. We our uh, the people by making the leaflet. And um, also we helped the policy maker making the policy, but not all the universities have moved forward. Not all the academics have moved forward. Uh, on the top, we have seen that uh, many people uh, were waited in the queue for uh, testing and many of them were get infected just uh, standing in this uh, queue. But we do not know, we did not transmit uh, the instruction how to manage these uh, people, how to manage this queue. So this kind of challenge, testing challenge we have seen in other countries like in Nepal and many other uh, places. And again, we have seen uh, 
this virus is spread uh, in the daycare center, also all in the old home, because we do not know how to separate uh, these uh, people. We had no instruction. We had um, not transmitted this knowledge to the policymaker and the ordinary people, ordinary management of this uh, healthcare or, 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 or this daycare center. Uh, not only the corona patient, also non-corona patient also uh, suffered because suddenly doctor become um, actually actually busy with the coronavirus patient treatment. And when some uh, uh, hospitals were dedicated for the corona treatment, they were not offering any service to non-corona uh, patient. Uh, so here, the, the thing is that did our government leaders try to engage us uh, to overcome this situation? Like in our university, we have come forward, but did the government or leaders try to engage us to uh, all of them to overcome this situation? Have we worked with the society enough? Did we feel uh, our responsibility for the society? Did we come forward to help the government with our expertise and capacity to improve the situation? If not, then where is the barrier? Uh, do we have enough leadership skill to come forward? So this situation was uh, worsened. We have seen that uh, the patients were moving from one hospital to another hospital, both corona patient and non-corona patient were moving from one hospital to another hospital. They were not getting the treatment. Sometimes hospitals uh, were denying them to give the treatment because, uh, because, because they, do not, uh, were, they were not dedicated for the corona treatment or uh, even the hospitals who has the facility of, of the corona treatment, they were afraid of other patients uh, that they may be transmitting the virus. So uh, we, uh, we did not uh, actually transmit this information to the society in which hospital every patient should go, which kind of hospital is dedicated for the corona. Also, we have seen that ambulance driver were reluctant to, to transport the corona patient. Um, and also, uh, the situation was worsened when the fake information and stigma were spreaded in the society. Stigma can deprive the people to hide the illness, to avoid the discrimination, prevent people from seeking the healthcare immediately. Uh, uh, this fear and stigma slow down the COVID-19 prevention, but have we come forward uh, to improve this situation or not? Even we had a problem uh, with the dead bodies, people were not giving the, uh, were not cooperating uh, to bury the dead bodies. We, we, we have seen that uh, crematorium staffs reluctant to handle the bodies. Actually, even sometimes uh, law enforcement uh, actually people has to come forward to bury those bodies. Although the who who already said that after the dead. Uh, dead, dead bodies after the date of uh, three hours, dead body will not transmit the virus. But have we actually uh, transmitted this knowledge, this information to the society, to the common people, so that uh, they act uh, actually socially? Probably not. We should have said them the virus don't discriminate. We should not discriminate. We should. Coronavirus can affect anyone, so we should uh, work regardless of the race, gender, and age, because this stigma can actually, uh, this fear and stigma can slow down the coronavirus prevention. But what role we play to stop this stigma? Have we explained the society that uh, they should change their view? Where are the barriers uh, to academic social linkages? Actually, the young researcher can raise their voice. They can uh, do many things. Young researchers have duties toward the society. Some of the young academics have done this, but these are the some of the least that we have done, although we have seen not everyone is doing that, uh, the same thing. For example, we can transmit or translate the science communication to simple layman terminologies to the society people. Uh, work actively in social media against rumor, fake or false news, and answer to the question of the ordinary people. Also, uh, we can work to bridge the gap between science and the policy, uh, promote good practices, act as a volunteer for collecting sample, testing, data analysis, reporting. We also actually test, uh, we have trained some doctor how to wear the PPE. They were not trained enough for that even. So young researchers should come forward. Uh, we volunteered in the local media science organization. We contributed in making biosafety guidelines for hospitals, school media, law enforcement, uh, etc. So we young researchers should uh, come forward and we have uh, actually um, convinced our government to engage all of us because 
probably uh, not all of us uh, served uh, actively. Have we offered our best? Probably not. There is a gap between science and academic, science academics and the society probably still. Uh, probably we are enough trained as a researcher, but not enough to be leaders, or don't know how to offer our service to the society. Uh, these are some do's and don'ts uh, I have collected from the WHO to stop the stigma. We can raise our um, voice. I'm not going through all of uh, this. Uh, actually, this is uh, from the WHO. So we should transmit this knowledge. So as a researcher and part of the society, we are uh, doing our duty during this pandemic situation not. This question is there. Most of the young researchers are just researchers yet to become leaders or there is a lack of knowledge in science diplomacy. So let's put this topic science, uh, let's put this topic science diplomacy and academia social responsibility in our curriculum so that we know what our responsibility and how to move forward, how to offer our best to the society. So we have to uh, act responsibility and socially maintain the social distance. So stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks for patient listening. Thank you, Abu. So um, I have my first question here. So as a young academician here, uh, what will be your leadership role that uh, you think you can actually um, help the influence or, you know, reduce this uh, dramatic uh, situation here that you have in your country? Um, actually, as I have mentioned that most of us are researchers. We do not know how to offer this service, how to deal with government because I cannot offer my service alone. I have to come together along with my colleagues. I have to uh, negotiate with the government. For example, when we, uh, when we were discussing with the government, uh, the health and, and the regulatory authority of the healthcare system that we can offer testing facilities, government were very reluctant. They were not uh, listening to us. Maybe we are too young, Maybe we should go in a coordinated fashion. We should go with our, uh, actually our senior academics. As a young researcher, with coordination with our senior academics, we can sit together with the government uh, to convince that in this kind of situation, we have to work together, not independently. Because uh, there are actually knowledge and training in the university academics that can be transmitted, transmitted to the society in kind in this kind of uh, pandemic situation or emergency situation i totally agree with, with the country of over 168 million people the testing facility are really strained on many levels right and i heard that uh, they are, you actually did most of testing in dhaka only the main place some yes. other locations doesn't have any facilities um so, so no, that's why many universities have come forward to offer testing uh, facilities testing center we actually borrowed pcr machine from di different departments like microbiology department genetic engineering department pharmacy department we actually set our uh, own um, testing facility then we actually convinced our vice chancellor that is the president of university uh, so that he can talk to the government that we are capable enough. Uh, we, we, we have the uh, safety measurement. We have the BSL-2, biosafety level two and three facilities. They can mm -hmm. safely give us the sample. We will not collect sample, but we can. We have the enough uh, actually safety measurement uh, for doing the test. So this is actually how we have done. We uh, convinced our vice chancellor, the president of university, then he actually convinced the government. Mm, that's very really environment actually. And can you can you also comment on the fact that the um, what what is what is the investment in the uh, preventive staff? Uh, for example, the frontline workers, right? Instead, of, you know, the doctor actually have to see the patient uh, before it's too late. Do you have that kind of program? I mean, in Thailand, we have that. You know, they have the frontier go out to village from village to village. Can you please comment on that? Uh, actually, we do not have this uh, community medicine or family healthcare system, family physician, we do not have. Whenever uh, we have a common flu, we go to the very big professor because we do not know uh, where to go or what to do, what is the proper channel. We, uh, this, can, this kind of situation can be improved if you have a family physician system or community health service system. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the family physician will tell uh, 
uh, will refer to the specialist. But whenever we have a common fever or flu, we go to the specialist and we make them busy. We have a 170 million people, but actually not enough doctor, not enough specialist. So uh, the system has to be improved. Uh, this system can be improved by implementing the right policy. This is, the, uh, this is actually uh, the matter of taking the decision. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think the time is almost up, right? Seven? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Kadimul. I would thank like you. for the last five to 10 minutes, maybe uh, uh, invite the audience and all of the participants to, to raise general questions to any of the speakers. I think we have about like five minutes for general questions. Um, if you want to uh, hear from a specific speaker, then please specify the name of the speaker in your question. I would just like to take some time for people to, to recapture what, what we, we covered in this session. I think we have one now from Chandra Kala Sharma. Can I, can I read, Stefan? Yes, please. Yeah. So um, thanks, um, no. thanks, Kamido Islam, for bringing the practical reason relating to COVID-19. It is true that the stigma relating to issues are high in low middle income country. Is the Bangladesh government have launched any special incentive program to come back to help the frontline health workers fighting COVID-19 patients? But you already said you have, don't have any frontline workers, right? Uh, actually, we do not have that kind of frontline uh, workers. So what we have done from the university, so we uh, faculty members and students we are giving this service uh, to our IEDCR, that is uh, the regulatory author authority of the healthcare system. That we said uh, we have trained people, we have trained student who knows how to the RT PCR, who knows uh, how to collect the sample, who knows uh, how to safeguard themselves. So they can be employed to collect sample and bring them to the testing facility center. They can be sent. Uh, they can be sent to the people uh, to convince and how to. Uh, do the hand washing and we can also we are also uh, giving the training to the doctors how to uh, wear the uh, PPE you can uh, you will see that there are many doctors died from the corona infection but none of these students died from the corona infection they were not infected at all because they have the training they know how to safeguard themselves so uh, this is the how we convinced uh, we set an example to the government that See, our academicians, our students are trained enough. Even uh, sometimes uh, they have can safeguard themselves compared to the uh, physicians. So then the government was convinced and they employed these uh, graduates to their uh, actually these regulatory uh, bodies. Uh, like actually there was a recent recruitment of uh, 40 graduates from our university and other universities uh, to this healthcare uh, system so that they can be a front liner. So we yeah. actually you could convince government, we set an example that we can fight. We can uh, do the things during the crisis moment. Thank you, Abul, for such a nice explanation and answer. We have another question and uh, it goes to you. And this question is asked by Dr. Meghna Dimal from Nepal. And uh, he said that, have you started pooled sample RT-PCR as well? as well, environmental sample testing for SARS-CoV-2 in Bangladesh? Uh, actually, um, for testing purpose, there is no, but for research purpose, yes, we have uh, started uh, collecting environmental samples at different universities and institutes have, have taken this initiative, uh, testing the environmental samples, so water, sways, and also where the PPE hand gloves are disposed uh, this kind of thing, and also the old uh, samples are. Th these are uh, are for only for research purpose, not for a large scale testing or other purpose. This is not from the government. This is from the universities. Okay, thank you, Abul. Uh, if Stephen permits, I have one question uh, for either see Fatmavati or Shama may answer, or any of these speakers can answer. Uh, so, how this pandemic uh, has affected badly? See, we we have seen that. Uh, compared to senior academies, maybe young scientists are badly affected, but under young scientists also, how women are badly affected compared to men? Uh, any comment? Uh, 
any of the speaker can address either Shama, Fatmavati or any, any. Okay, so you, uh, you ask about how the use of the young scientist. Is it, uh, I understand correct? Yeah, how women young scientists are affected due to this pandemic. What is your thought or comment? Oh, actually, I think that it's uh, this pandemic was a very good chance for the young scientists. They proved themselves in many regions and in many disciplines. So, um, for example, I told you Africa have many lives and many works together. Uh, I think that's open a, a very good chance for the young scientists, especially to be connected for the uh, organizations, government, policy makers. Because nowadays we have uh, our voice is raising to the policymakers, and they can now, uh, how to say, they, they can uh, work together with us, and they uh, they can encourage us to complete. They they believe in our work nowadays. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Shama, for addressing the question. Uh, yes, Monir is. Would you like to yeah. ask? Yeah, I would like to add something in this question. Mm, that is, mm, pandemic has influenced young researchers, both male and female, both positively and negatively. Negatively that many have lost their jobs or work, as I know from my experience in Australia. Even the fact is that out of five, one scientist is thinking to uh, leave the research career. Uh, positive side is that it has created opportunity for young scientists to come forward. <clears throat> for example, uh, National Young Academy of Bangladesh started working for COVID before the senior academy. Okay. And uh, we can mention the name of Nova Ahmed, Global Young Academy member, executive committee member. <laughs> she raised the issue in our forum that we should do something. And our first work was that simple science presentation to the people. <clears throat> we prepared a um, leaflet saying that for fighting COVID, we have to do two things. First, we have to prevent the entry of the virus in our body how wearing masks, washing hands, all other things. And second, we have to improve our immune system. Wow, fantastic. So, uh, mm. Th thank so, you so much. Mm, uh, the thank issue you. is that women and young scientists, they had the opportunity to become the leader in this global crisis. I think you are happy to know that young and women scientists are working to fight this one. Because you ladies are very much concerned about the ladies, how they are doing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Monir. And uh, we have already seen that due to this pandemic, the role has reversed. Those who are like female, they have gone out if they are uh, workers, medical workers, and their husbands have uh, taken care of the homes. It, this is I think the speciality of this pandemic and that reversal role are observed in this pandemic. So men and women each are the complementing their, uh, I think, job. So I, I have one last question if there is a time. Uh, we have from all the speakers I've heard uh, that um, policies, government, and these needs to be changed, leadership is required. Uh, so at the global level, what can be done all together, all the countries together, can we address this problem? If, if possible, quick answer, any, any speaker. Uh, if I'm allowed, I want to add my point. Yeah, please. Not now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, but actually, the time is almost up, right? Stefan, can we just have uh, some to hear from some other people, just real quick? Let's hear one answer and then let's take this discussion to the coffee break or the substitute we may find. Sure. 
Um, anybody else? Sorry. Um, let's do writing loud, you know, like 30 seconds, one minute. Daniel, go. Oh. So, yeah, uh, the, the international collaboration that uh, is needed for, for facing and, and, and tackling this, this pandemic, uh, the, the response has been uh, uh, not the best. Uh, I think that uh, uh, we need to, we, we can do better. And that was part of my, of my, of my presentation that we, we need more collaborations and more uh, partnerships. Uh, however, I can say that in, in comparison with uh, the beginning of the pandemic and what is going on uh, uh, nowadays, today, I think that uh, is, uh, it has been uh, uh, an improvement in the, in the response of governments and, 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 and scientific societies and, 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 and institutions to, uh, to this uh, pandemic. I, it, it took some time. It took some time to realize that only uh, uh, joining the efforts uh, will be uh, possible to, to, to uh, to tackle this pandemic. That's what I have, I can, I can add. Thank you very much. So as our session closes, I would like to say, thank my co-hosts, Dr. Arya and Dr. Pia Ratanameta. I'm also very grateful to all the speakers and I extend my thanks to the audience. Um, thank you like for sharing. Thank you for being with us in the past uh, 90 minutes. Stay well and uh, all the best in going forward. Have a nice afternoon, have a nice morning or a nice evening wherever you are and enjoy also the remaining part of the World Health Summit. Great to see you all. Goodbye. Hope to see you then. Bye-bye, thank you.